What is up, heroes? It's Minute Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, the finale, we completed the game. We finished up the last of the puzzles, we learned about the secret of the Golden Apple, and had quite the, the dramatic conclusion to our story, which I absolutely loved. I shared all of my thoughts on the game until this point, and I asked you guys about your experiences with the game, and it was a pleasure having the chance to um, read those, and for those of you that are sticking around for these bonus episodes, we're going to be taking on, well, the bonus puzzles. So, without further ado, let's hop into it. I have not played the game in a few days, um, life got pretty busy, but I've been dying to get a chance to have a go at some of these challenges, so let's hop into the inventor's house, where you're gonna test our wits against the hardest puzzle the professor has to offer. Do you have what it takes to solve them? Okay, so there are three in each of these houses, maybe? Either way, we got puzzle 121 here. Diamond in the flag. Do give this puzzle a try. That's right! What am I gonna do without some corny uh, transition into, oh, it looks like you could use a puzzle. Alright, below is a diagram of a flag. From the measurements shown on the diagram, can you calculate what fraction of the flag's total area is represented by the diamond in the middle? Your answer will be the denominator for a fraction in 1 over x form. Don't complicate things by bringing trigonometry into the mix. The solution is simple enough to work out in your head. Wow, okay, so they're, they're bringing out <laughs> the trigonometry and... Um, wow, um, not very, I guess, like... I guess friendly terminology to some degree, um, or potentially even accessible, but let's take a look. So the first thing is, um, we're looking for the fraction of the flag's total area that's represented by the diamond. Um, obviously our denominator, for prior to simplifying things, is going to be the area of the, the large orange rectangle, which is going to be 80 times 120 or 9600. So now we've got to figure out how do we get that, that blue area in the center. Um, because it's in the middle of a rectangle and the distances um, on both sides of the, the vertices are equal, um, I think we're going to be dealing with a, a rhombus here, or a parallelogram at least. Um, so let's draw a little bit. Can I draw? I can. Okay, so this horizontal distance here we know is 60, and then this vertical distance here is going to be 40. Okay, so it's a parallelogram. Or, no, it could technically be a rhombus, too. Um, I'm pretty sure the area is just the the, di the, <laughs> the product of the diagonals. I actually think it's just going to be 2400 here. However, I would like to confirm that, um, admittedly. So what we can do is we can actually split this up into triangles like so. So, actually, I'm going to clear this real quick because I want to split it up into these triangles so we don't do unnecessary calculation. So the horizontal distance here in the middle is going to be 60, as we mentioned, and then this height is going to be what? Well, it's going to be 40 divided by 2, so 20. So the area of a triangle is base times height divided by 2. This top triangle is going to be what? 60 times, what would, would we say it was, 20? Yeah divided by 2. Now you'll also notice though that this bottom triangle is actually going to be the same area because it has the same base and it'll have the same height. So it'll be plus the same thing times base, you know, base times height over 2. So what we can do is we can actually just get rid of that 2 in the denominator. Um, which means that this is actually um, different from what I initially had anticipated. Um, this would be 60 times 20. Um, which would be 1,200, not the 2,400 I had originally imagined. So just to be clear, 20 times 60 divided by 2 plus 20 times 60 divided by 2. So it should be 20 times 60, 1,200. And then 1,200 over 9,600 is just going to be 1 eighth. So x should be 8. And I need to review my geometry formulas for the areas of for the area of a parallelogram. I thought it was just base times height. Although we obviously have the diagonals, what we had here was the diagonals, not the the base and the height per se. Um, 
But I know there's some formula involving the diagonals I haven't used in a while, so I'm gonna have to look that up. Let's try 8. Because, yeah. Um... I believe the blue area is 1,200, and the total area is 9,600. All right. I did it! Yes! Luke did it! Congratulations! Okay, the measurements on each area of the diagram are the key to the puzzle. If you draw a line or two to supplement the diagram's information, it's easy to see that the diamond represents one-eighth of the flag's area. Oh, that's actually a really cool graphical representation. Um, if you look at the diagram they drew, it says you could basically split it into smaller rectangles and you could see that one-fourth of the blue area um, forms, well, one-eighth of, well, one-fourth of the rectangle. <laughs> um, so that's, that's actually really cool, a really nice visual representation that, I guess, is a lot simpler than having to do any sort of calculation. But regardless, splendid solving, of course, I expected nothing less from you. Aw, thanks, Leighton. Okay, the next die. You must give it your all. Give it our all we will. <laughs> Another 60 picker at puzzle. Okay. The three and six dotted sides of several dice are lined up end to end to form a particular pattern. Which of the three options below should go next in order to continue the pattern? Wow. Okay. So we're doing some pattern where we're lining up the threes and the six. Um... I mean, hmm, how do they want us to do this? Oh, <laughs> I was looking at the three answer choices as if they were the three things that we were supposed to base our pattern off of. No, but we're looking at the bottom row and using that to determine the pattern and then filling in the question mark block all the way on the right. So the first thing I want to look at is, is the number of threes and sixes consistent? So we have three threes, oh, I can't draw. So you have three threes, a six, a three, a six, a three, a six, a three, a six. So why are there three threes in the beginning and then a six and then they seem to alternate for a while before then going back, <laughs> right? So the orientation, they're, they're flipping uh, 90 degrees each time, right? Or they're like flipping the slope of the, the line, I guess. What's interesting is all of the sixes are horizontal. And so, um, I guess in terms of whether, you know, they're left, going from bottom left to top right, or top left to bottom right, I'm gonna refer to them by their slope. So top left to bottom right will be a negative slope. Um, bottom left to top right will be positive slope. So for the threes, we have negative, positive, negative, then we have a six, then we have a positive, then we have a six, then we have a positive, then we have a six, then we have a negative for some reason, and then a six, and, and then a what? So, at first glance, I don't, I don't really know. Um, there's nothing that's really jumping out. I'm wondering if you have to know the what other sides are being shown? Like, are they trying to connect the other sides in a particular way? The other sides of the die, that is. Hmm. <clears throat> I mean... So there has to be some sort of like function that takes you from one die to the next, or one set of die to the next set, if it's some sort of like mathematical thing. Um, if it is truly just like pattern recognition or whatnot, um, or if it's something, you know, more subtle, maybe even like word-based or more subjective that might not lead us in the right direction, but I don't I don't think that'll be the case. Hmm. We only have three answer choices possible. I don't think it would be reasonable to to guess. And they're obviously making the assumption that we can deduce what this last thing is going to be from what's already been given.
Hmm. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to think like, if we're only working with threes and sixes, are we adding them together in some sort of way? Or is it like you add the number of dots and based on a property of that sum at that point in the sequence, it needs to either be like, you know, horizontal or, or shifted one way or another. If we're like three, six, nine, and then 15, 18, 21, or no, 15, 18, 24, 27, hmm, I mean 33, 36, and then 39. So, I'm trying to, to see something, and the only thing that's giving me trouble right now is the sixes. It looks like when the, if you're adding the number of dots, at least for the threes, if the, if the sum at that point in the series is even, it's a positive slope three, and if it's negative, and if it's odd, it's a negative slope three. So we have three and it's, you know, negative slope, six, positive slope, nine, negative slope, and then we have 15 and the six is on its side, and then we have 18, it's positive slope, then we have 24, but then the six is on its side. That's part of what has me a little bit troubled because the six is, um, despite being 15 and then uh, 24, they're in the same orientation. But regardless, oh, it was 24, right? Oh, so then 27 should be negative, but it's not. So that, that debunks that possible, possible pattern. Hmm. Does it have anything to do with that? Or is it more of like a, like a repeating structure that has a changing component? <clears throat> I don't know why there are the threes in the beginning, but I was looking like, maybe if you just look at the six dice, right? Um, in the very first six dice, it's negative positive, and then it's positive positive, then it's positive negative. So then one might think it would be negative negative, um, as in the, the three block on the left of the six, or the three die, the three die on the left and then the three die on the right. They're kind of changing this pattern where one of them is changing each time. So again, like I said, going from left to right on the blocks surrounding each six die, it would be like negative positive and then positive positive and then positive negative and then um, potentially negative negative. But that doesn't really account for the, the threes in the beginning, right? I'm thinking maybe there needs to be some sort of like connectivity between them. But that kind of stops after the fifth or sixth die. Right? So if you look at like the first three set of threes, they always have, you know, the starting point of on the left, the, the dot on the left connects to the dot on the far right of the previous die. But I don't know how the sixes play a role in that, you know? Because after the um, the sixth die that kind of breaks, right? Like they follow along this path and then after the second six, um, you no longer have a continuous path. And I thought that might be the, the route. Hmm. What is the relationship? How do these dice relate to each other? Let's see, what can I use? It's not going to be negative. 
Oh, well that rules out that other <laughs> thing I'd suggested. But it can't be a negative three. It has to be one of the two orientations of the six or the positive of the three. So it can't be the negative three. Does that tell us anything? I feel like... No, they wouldn't do that. I was gonna say that I feel like it has to do with what's on the the sides of the die of the die that aren't shown. However, for any orientation they show, whether it's like positive or negative or horizontal or vertical for the sixes, there are two different ways. Um, there are two different configurations that could lead to that one visible side in the orientation it is. So that can't be the case. I don't know, guys. I'm gonna think on this one a bit because. Because I like these challenging ones, but we may we may be in hint territory sometime soon. So, so at fir at first glance, um, something that I'm I'm trying to think of, I guess ways you can approach this um, to just come up with maybe reasonable answers without even perceiving the intended pattern, maybe. And I'm looking at each type of piece and seeing what comes after and see if there are any recurring patterns, right? So the very first die is a negative three. And what comes to the right of it, it's a positive three. And then the next negative three, we look to the right and it's a six, horizontal six. And then we look at the next negative three and it's another horizontal six. So if I had to guess, I would think if something had to come after a negative three, it would probably be one of those two things we've already seen come after negative threes. Similarly, for positive threes, what comes after those? The first thing to come after is a negative three. The second is a horizontal six. The third is a horizontal six. So I would I would bet that it's one of those two things as well. And then we say, okay, what about the horizontal six? Well, a positive three comes after the first, a positive three comes after the second, and a negative three comes after the third. So I would be inclined to think that a positive three, or really a, a three die would probably come after a horizontal six, which is um, what we're looking to find out in this problem. So I, I would bet on A if I had to guess, but I don't think that's quite the solution, if you know what I mean. I wouldn't say we've really solved the, the pattern with that, even if we were to get that right. So I do want to think about it more, but that's, that's currently the most, I guess, concrete thing I can think of at the moment, is that up until this point, one, we haven't seen a, a vertical six, so we would really have to understand the meaning of each individual die to, to figure that out. Hmm. How many die are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There are eleven die. Is that relevant? Why might there be eleven die? I guess something interesting about there being 11 die is that that's a prime number, which is cool. But um, <laughs> but importantly, it means it can't be broken down into um, like a well, it doesn't have any you know divisors other than one, so it can't be broken down into multiples of you know sets of a particular number. So it's not like we're looking for a pattern amongst sets of three dice or even pairs of dice. It has to be each individual die, and it's not like it can even be, uh, I guess, like, regularly, at least without being really obtuse, um, regularly changing number of sets of dice, right? So it's not like it's a, we're looking at the first four dice, then the next three, then the next two, then the final one, because that would be ten. Um, it would have to be something really obscure if it were something that where it's like the number of dice in each set you're looking at as you're looking at multiple sets. Uh, if that's changing, it has to be doing so in a pretty ob obtuse way in order to fit within, you know, a set of 11. So I don't think we're dealing with sets of dice. I really think we are getting from one, one die to the next. However, there has to be some sort of impact of prior dice on each one, um, because as we've talked about before, one type of one type of the dice doesn't always lead to the same next die. 
So, one of the things I'm thinking about now is I'm basically assigning the number of like the that die that die's place in the order from 1 to 11 and then seeing if there's some sort of relationship between the numbers that have the same representation by the die. For example, all of the negative threes are shown on 1, 3, and 9. So maybe that's relevant to powers of 3, for example. Um, all of the positive 3 dice are with 2, 5, and 7. I don't see quite as much there. Um, yeah, I don't really... I don't really see a lot in terms of a pattern there other than 2 plus 5 is 7. Um, maybe they would want like 5 plus 7 would give you 12, but... Um, and then in terms of the horizontal 6s, it would be 4, 6, 8, and 10. So there are all of the, the even numbers that aren't 2. Now, one of the limitations of doing something like this is to say, oh, well, then you're obviously not going to introduce a new die at the end, right? That would eliminate B, basically, as an answer choice. If I were to base what 11 would be off of this, unless I said there's no way it can be anything that, it, that fits the pattern of the all three other uh, patterns. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think on this for a bit. Alright, so after after thinking about it, um, I admittedly think this may be a little bit too overkill for something like Layton, but but what I'm thinking could work, I guess, would fit within what they've shown here, would be all of the negative 3 die, right? The negative slope 3 die are powers of 3. So the first one is 3 to the 0 with power, which is 1. The second negative 3 die is in the third spot, so 3 to the first power. And then the third and only other um, negative 3 die is 9, which is 3 squared. And then I think all of the positive 3 dice um, represent prime numbers that are not powers of 3, um, which would obviously only be an exception for 3. So 2, 5, 7, and then what would also be 11. And then all of the um, all of the six the sixes that are horizontal would be all of the even numbers that are not prime. So that would rule out two. And that would between those three, I guess, groups, you would cover you would have something for every number if you wanted to continue this pattern on past eleven as well. So so I think that would work. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is that it's not like a like a recurring unit or anything, but but at the same time, and it's not necessarily dependent. You don't go from one die to the next based on some sort of function, right? It's more so assigning a value to that slot and then representing it in a particular way based on the property of the number of that slot. But, but from what I described, powers of 3 being the negative 3, um, prime numbers that are not a power of 3, <laughs> uh, being the, the positive 3, and then even numbers that are not prime, or even composite numbers, being the horizontal 6s, I think, I think that makes sense. It certainly fits what we have here, and it would imply that 11 is the positive 3. Because it would also be a, a prime number. And when we were talking about before, that is consistent with our, our best guess that I was talking about before. The only thing I don't like is that... It doesn't seem to be like a recurring unit or, or clear, I don't know, you get from one number to the next based on this, which I feel like they may be going for. And I don't know if they want... So they, they mention B as like the vertical six, but it never shows up. So I don't know if it's like a, 
you might think it could show up, or it's it's really not even in you know contention, right? Um, but I think I'm gonna go with A here, and I think I'm tempted to try that because I feel like I have come up with a pattern or at least some rule to assign a representation of a die to each slot in this pattern that's consistent with all of the dice that they've shown thus far. So I feel like the this would this would work. But we'll see if it's what they really intend. So, um let's give it let's give it a go. A. I think I've got it. Oh no, it wasn't A. Oh, I was sure I had it. Hmm. Okay, these dice may seem like they're laid out randomly, but if you pay attention to one element, you'll see there's really a method behind their arrangement. Alright, so I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll try again, obviously. Uh, this, I feel like, is starting to fall under now the unfortunate category of, well, am I going to see it the way Leighton wants me to see it? <laughs> we will see. We will see. Um, we know it's not A, obviously, so it's going to be a 6. So it's the first time that a 6 is going to follow another 6. Um, and it doesn't, and it's not the, the rule that I came up with before. And it seems it's about one element. So it's not, it's probably not as complex as, are they composite, are they even, are they odd, or, or whatnot. Hmm. If you pay attention to one element, the arrangement becomes obvious. What element would that be? The way they say it, it makes it sound like it's like the number <laughs> that the slot represents. Yeah, I don't know, guys. Um, I've been I've been thinking more, and well, I mean, while what I thought of before, I guess, like technically works. I mean, it it definitely seems too specific and, and intricate for something like this. And the way they said, you know, once you pay attention to one element, it'll be obvious, makes me think that there's there's got to be one kind of easy, just like you look at it, you know, and you see the arrangement. Not like a, you get into some sort of calculation or some representation of things. It's got to be like, I don't know, like the connectivity between the dice blocks, for example, or, or something like that. You know what these kind of remind me of? I'm kind of looking at the, I guess like if you were to connect the dots per se. Um, they remind me of the different portions of that one like S that everybody would draw in grade school, right? Where you draw like the three vertical lines and then you kind of connect them in different ways. And yeah, <laughs> those of you, those of you that know, know. Um, but I think, I think it's time we turn to one of the hints. Examine the dice and try to find a reason or method to their orientation. <laughs> really? You might think that the dice's arrangement has to do with the total number of dots, but this puzzle is far more simple. Just pay attention to the way the dots on the dice line up. That's exactly what I've already been doing! <laughs> That's already what I've been doing. Uh, I mean, I already tried like a lot of the number stuff, but the way the dots line up, that's that's what I'm doing. And I mean, you follow like like connectivity or something like that. And I don't see a repeating pattern. The way the dots are lined up. I'm trying to think of it almost like a picture, right? Like, what are they drawing? What do they want me to see from looking at it? Is it supposed to, like, look like something? That's like on its side, like a like a caterpillar or a train or something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna go for a second hint because I'm clearly not on the right track. Look at the way the dots are lined up. See how there are three rows of dots stacked on top of one another? Yeah, one of those rows holds the key to this puzzle. I thought about that in terms of how many dots there are in each row. I think there was what six in the middle 
And then one, two, three, three, six, four, ten, four, five, fifteen, eighteen. And then one, two, three, four, five. So we're at six. Four is ten. I mean, well, yeah, eleven. Uh, 15, 18, right? So it should be 18, 6, and then, then 18. Yeah, I even, I even thought about this, <laughs> looking at each of the rows of dots individually. But I don't see... I don't see it yet. And I'm trying to think, like... If I were to be, if it were to be B, right? It would be 20 and then seven and then 20. <clears throat> then if it were C, it would be 21, six and then 21. And that doesn't really ring a bell to me either. Oh, I think I see it. I think I see it. If you look at the top row, the, I guess like the connected dots, the sets of connected dots are increasing by one. So, for example, in the top row in the first die, there's a one dot set. And then between the second and third die or dice, there's a set of two that are connected. And then on the fourth die, there's an independent set of three. And then with the fifth and sixth, there's a set of four. And then with the seventh, eighth, and ninth, they form five. And so then maybe with the tenth and eleventh, you'd form six by having two horizontal in a row. I guess somewhat similarly. Actually, no, not even. Hmm. Because looking at the bottom, I'm trying to think like, what if you looked at the other rows, right? So like in the bottom row, it'd be like two and then five and then four and then three and then four. So I think they're gonna want C because it's that top row. So we'll give that a go. Um, I feel like the next hint would just so? give it away, so... That's it! And let's see if that's the Make correct answer. Saves the day. Rather, that's the right rationale. Yeah, that is. I don't like that. <laughs> I... I don't really like that, honestly. Um, if you look at the dots of the dice, it's three rows stacked on top of each other. You can see that there's a trend in the top row of dots. The groups of dots continuing in an unbroken chain in the top row increases by one each time. Final set of dots should be six dots in a row, and you need three more dots to make that happen. Therefore, the answer is C. Yeah, honestly, I'm not a big fan of of this one. Um, for a lot of the same reasons as the other stuff. It's kind of like, of the three rows, I mean, yes, you can see that if you look at it in that way, like, this, the top row specifically has a pattern, but that may be... If you look at the other rows, there's no pattern. So, so is it really, are, would the player be confident enough? Would the solver be confident enough to see, that, oh, there is a pattern in this one subsection if I look at it this way and be like, that has to be the pattern governing the entirety of the arrangement. Yeah, not really, not really a big fan. I guess, hmm, I'm trying to think of how I would have improved it or what I would have liked done to the puzzle to make it. I guess more in, in tune with what I'm looking for. And I can't think of a whole lot. Um, I guess a little bit more more narrow. I mean, it's not about making it obvious, right? But I guess I, I feel like there's so much potential for red herrings, I guess. And, and potential to work with those red herrings in ways that are meaningful, right? I did come up with a pattern, albeit specific or a set of rules that governed the arrangements of the dice of the dice as well and i'm sure other people may look into things as well it's like with something like this it's do you look at sets of the dice do you look at the individual die do you look at a function between you know the dice do you look at representations, right? I was talking about how there's like the slot one and then there's a representation of that as a die. And then there's slot two. And then, you know, there's similar representation based on a property that's similar between those those slot numbers. There's, there's a lot of level of complexity. And I feel like even if you were to notice something like the one, two, three, four, five, 
Um, I, I don't know if I would necessarily immediately be compelled to be like, that has to be the pattern, and then completely disregard the other rows, which clearly don't have a pattern, and all of that other stuff. So, yeah, overall, not, not really my favorite kind of puzzle, but interesting nonetheless. Okay, um, it's already been quite a bit of time IRL. <laughs> Granted, uh, I'm sure it's been shortened down for you guys. So let's, well, we'll, we'll, do, we'll try this one more. I want to really get through the inventor's house. <laughs> Tons of triangles. It's pretty exciting. Go on, Luke, do give this puzzle your best try. Oh, I will. I will. For puzzle number one, two, three. Ooh, this looks neat. The diagram below shows a triangle with several lines running through it. How many different triangles can you spot? Okay, so the first one that I mean, can I draw? Please tell me I can draw. Okay. So, actually, let's work from smallest to, to largest. So, there are three small triangles of this size. Um, I think this is an equilateral triangle because it looks very symmetrical. So, we have one, two, three triangles like that. I'm going to... I should tally. Uh, but tallying is not... Well, oh, well. And then we have this central equilateral triangle. Potentially. So, that's four. Okay, now we're going to kind of jump up to the, not quite the entire triangle, but still sub-triangles. So we have, actually I'm going to clear this and say, we, alright, we're at four, based on the small triangles. Now for the medium-sized triangles. We have this triangle here. That's one. Oh wow, and so we're basically going to have three of every type because of the symmetry. So that's two, and then there's three. Okay, so we're going to add that, and we're going to get seven. And now I said, some of you are screaming because I missed some of the smaller or the medium-sized ones. I know, I know. I just wanted to clear things up so I could show them more easily. So then we have this longer type of triangle as well. One, and then we have this longer triangle as well. And then we have one over here too. So that's three more. So we're at ten already. And then we have the the large triangle forming the 11th triangle. And now I'm going to look and see if there's anything else I can conjure up in my head. <laughs> um, I think... I think we got most... Yeah, I mean, I think so, right? Uh, another way you could think about it is look at each vertex and then see um, for each like line that goes through, what triangles does it form? So like this one will form two triangles, right? Sorry, the touchpad went crazy there. <laughs> but that would form two triangles um, that way. It would also form a triangle here and a triangle here. Did I get this one? Ooh, I don't think I got these ones. This one with the obtuse triangle here. I don't think I got that one. I think I extended it all the way. I counted this one, but not the one if you shorten it like that. So that would add on another three, actually, because you can, again, do that in all the different ways. So now we're at 14, actually. And I need to be more careful. <laughs> um, And I think I, I got these ones, right? I got all of these ones. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Are there any other triangles that I'm seeing? No, I don't think so. I think I think 14 is all of them. I just kind of mentally went through them all in my head myself. And uh yeah, I want to try 14. I think I've got it. That was not correct. I've let you down, Professor. Oof. Wow, okay. I guess I got to look harder. <laughs> I thought I thought I'd gotten him, but I guess not. Okay. Okay. Let's see what we can do here. What did I miss? How many different triangles? 
So again, there was the, the three small ones, right? So we got those. And then there's this one in the middle. Now we kind of bump up the size to, to medium size, right? We're gonna get this guy here, get this guy here, and we get this guy here. All right, so now we're at seven. And then, still on the, the topic of medium sized triangles, I guess, we get this obtuse one, right? And we get this obtuse one, and then we get this obtuse one. Now we're at 10. And then bumping it up the size a little bit more. Oh, I see what I did. Um, we have, you know, these ones. I realized, I thought I counted. Well, never mind, I'll get to it in a second. So we have these three. But then the other thing is we have these ones. I thought I counted these last time, but I must have actually counted this one, the smaller one instead. So we're actually gonna be three short. Um, it'll be 17, I think. So um, again, we have the one, two, three, four, and then we have this medium one, we have this medium one, we have this medium one, and we're at seven. Then we have this medium one, we have um, this medium one, and this medium one, we're at 10. Then we have this big one, and we have this big one, and we have this one, so we're at 13. And then we have these ones. These are the ones I didn't count. I thought I did, but I did not, um, unfortunately. And so now we're at 16, and then we have the big triangle, so we're at 17. So that's, that's what it is. My bad, guys. Why did I, why did I try to cross my seven there? Um, I hope 17 is the correct answer. I think it should be. I think be. I've got it! I think I've got it. Okay, that is it. Darn it. <laughs> I feel like this is a silly mistake. <laughs> and I thought, I mean, I like that one. Uh, that's pretty cool. And also, for those of you that don't know, which is probably 99% of you, 17 is one of my favorite numbers. That and 51. But nicely done. Your skills are growing by leaps and bounds, my boy. So that was a pretty cool one. Um, I actually, I really want to play more. <laughs> I really want to keep doing more, but I feel like that second puzzle took quite a bit of time. So I think this is a reasonable place to call it for now. Overall, those were neat. Um, I like the Inventor's House ones because they're, they seem to be more math related. And uh, geometry is something I like. Um, I'm bummed I didn't get the, the triangle one on my first try. I, I made that silly mistake, but, but nevertheless, um, they were neat. Uh, I already talked about the pattern one with the dice, and we already we still have the decorator's house, the art lover's house, and the golden apple's house, and then of course the puzzle master's house, which I presume is going to unlock once we complete the other houses. So I hope you guys are looking forward to those just as much as I am. But until the next episode, next bonus episode, this is Midnight Zero, and this mission is complete.